Morning, everybody. Let me just grab my notes. So it's the beginning of Advent. Um, three more weeks till Christmas. If if that is coming to a surprise, it came to a surprise to me this week that there's only 21 days until we're on the eve. It seems to creep up faster and faster every year, um, and it can always be a really busy time of the year. And and I guess today I want to. Slow, slow that rush down and just zoom in on um, a bit of an unlikely character in Mary. So some context on, uh, I guess, the, the start of the gospel message that we heard this morning in Luke. Um, we've got Mary and Joseph, um, a young, young couple. Mary's estimated to be about 14 years old. Joseph, about 30 and they're betrothed to each other in a fairly standard-looking um, Jewish relationship. Um, yeah, it, they're, they're just a, a, a poor family. Nothing really stands out about why they would be special. Um, and that, that's, yeah, it's something that I was reflecting on a lot of. Why was Mary so special? What was it about her that, that God saw and was like, you're going to carry my son? Um, and it becomes obvious pretty quickly in how Mary responds to the angel Gabriel. Um, so after, as we heard, after the angel um, greets Mary with, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. There's this real display of human nature of, she's really troubled and confused by that. Um, perhaps a bit of a why me, like, why is an angel of the Lord coming to talk to me? Um, and, yeah, th- th- this word favour that, that the angel Gabriel uses, it comes from the Greek word charis. Can we all say charis? Charis. Um, which, it's, a, it's more than just favour. It extends beyond that. Um, there's favour on the part of the giver, but thankfulness on the part of the receiver as well. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So after Mary is greeted um, by the angel Gabriel, um, there's then this doubt that, that she has and confusion, and, and Gabriel follows that up with, with revealing part of God's miraculous plan, that not only will she give birth as a virgin, but she will carry the Son of God whose kingdom knows no end, which I, I think is a bit of a wow moment of what a, what a thing to have an angel come to you and say, um, And I think Mary's response is, is fairly normal for any human. If, if that's what you're told, it's, it's like you think rationally, well, there's no way that's physically possible. Um, she's, she's betrothed to Joseph and, and is a virgin still. How could she be pregnant? Um, and so Gabriel's response to that is he reveals a bit more of the plan, um, emphasizing the miracle that that is in itself, but doubling down on that perhaps, um, and the work of the Spirit, not just in her life, but in the life of her relative Elizabeth, who in her barrenness in old age, God's also provided a miracle um, of pregnancy. And there's clarity on why she was favoured here, that the faithful obedience she displays when her response to God's plan is, I'm a servant of the Lord, let it be done according to your word. Like in that moment of going from confusion and, and like, why me, to hearing God's miraculous plan, to then just being in humble acceptance is a really powerful thing. And I think that that word charis that I mentioned before for this favour, we see further on in Luke when, when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. That, that whole passage is then just Mary rejoicing and singing praise in, in Elizabeth's house where she then stays for a few months. So what Mary's done is no easy thing to do, to be able to just submit and to hear what God's saying and that that plan, to have that trouble just totally flipped um, and that doubt and hesitation to turn into willingness and trust and faithfulness. It's a challenge that I'm sure any one of us would find very difficult to do, certainly in in that short interaction. So a bit of bit of backstory on me and, and kind of a story that I've got. As a kid, I always loved space, loved the stars, 
um, would always watch a lot of documentaries with Dad. Um, I've always been a fairly academic person, but not really into the creative side of things. Um, so at a fairly early stage of high school, I had, a, I had a pretty clear plan of what I wanted to do. I wanted to um, go to university and, and study space science and astrophysics, and I knew what courses I had to do at school to get there. Um, I know I was very lucky compared to a lot of other people in, in high school. Like I had a clear direction of where I wanted to go. Um, yeah, the plan was then finish school, go to university, do further study there, and, and get into to research. Um, and I'm, I was, and I'm st still am very passionate about that. Um, but I got to the end of my three-year degree, and I was just so burnt out and exhausted mentally, physically, spiritually. And if it wasn't for my passion in that, I don't think I would have completed that. And so I found myself at this crossroads of, I had this plan for the better part of a decade that I just wanted to complete, but I also knew that I couldn't do that without bringing more detriment to myself. Um, and this crossroads was one of the hardest decisions in my life that I've ever faced. Um, I knew that if I stopped, I needed to be very intentional with resting leaning into, into God, both so I could forgive myself for that baggage of, of not following through with my plan, um, but also that in the hopes of drawing closer to the Lord, I'd get a greater purpose. And, oh boy, I didn't expect the right I was in for in making that decision. Um, so I did choose to, to not continue studying, and within a month, um, God had revealed a lot of things to me. One, he had given a mission statement on my heart, um, which I've written down on a whiteboard in my office um, still, which was to influence the lives of many through the God-given experiences in my life and to share the goodness of the gospel. And it was in preparing this message today that it kind of hit me again. It's like, wow, God's doing that again. And he's using me to fulfill that. A couple months later, after that, um, an opportunity came up to direct a statewide youth camp called Novo, which some of you would be familiar with. Um, and I applied, not really knowing why I was applying, but I've now been doing that for, for two years, going into my third year as a director. God also moved in my heart and set in motion um, the plan for me to have a life partner. Um, and three months ago, yes, I got married to my wife, Sam, um, which was an absolutely amazing blessing in itself. Like, uh, along with all, the, all, all, all these things, I, I just found that my world was torn wide open um, in that decision and in engaging with God's presence. And for me, there was a clear point of transition where I could have kept holding on to my plan and, and holding on to the wheel or releasing that and letting God do the work. In that situation that I did choose to let go, I've reaped the benefits of God working in my life so much. There's plenty of times I've chosen not to let go as well times where I've run away from what God's wanting me to do. And there's often seasons where it doesn't feel like God's doing a whole lot. It can be frustrating. I'm sure many of you can relate to that, that, you know, there's just times it's like, God, what are you doing here? Where are you? We like our comfort. We like our bubble. We like doing the things that we know and, and are comfortable in. Our very own selfish human nature can be the biggest inhibitor to seeing what God is doing in our lives. We can get caught up focusing on what he isn't doing rather than focusing on what he is doing. Letting go of these comfort zones is no easy task. But there's a point of comfort. And God has an affinity to radically enter our lives and flip them on their heads. We see that all throughout scripture. where people, We as well run the, run the other direction and we can be assured that God radically loves us and pursues us. He's faithful and is persistent in how he pursues us in our hearts. In our reading from Jonah, we hear how Jonah hears the call of the Lord and decides, no, nope, I'm heading out, go in the opposite direction, gets on a boat. Um, and God doesn't give up on Jonah or, or Nineveh. He, he very, very determinedly is like, okay, Jonah, you can run from me, but I have a bigger plan and you're still a part of it. And we all know how the story of Jonah goes. Jonah gets swallowed by the fish and ends up in Nineveh doing what God called him to do to begin with. God's pursued me many times when I've heard his call. And many times I've turned. 
even in the opportunity to serve here and, and be bringing this message to you in the planning stages. There were so many thoughts in my brain being like, no, nah, I can't do it this Sunday. I'll, I'll wait till later and putting it off. Um, and similarly, God comes to this 14-year-old girl and totally flips her life. And in the midst of that, all she does is stand there and say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, which I think is pretty powerful. And so I, I, I want to challenge you with some things today. When God's entering our lives, what's our response? Do we respond like Mary and are we willing or do we respond like Jonah and run away? Do we submit to the Father's will or do we fail to let go of control? I think we should all aspire to be like Mary. Having those moments to process what God's saying and deal with the roller coaster that that often is but to then be able to put ourselves aside and just say, yes, Lord, I'm here. I encourage you all to reflect on what God might be calling you to do in your lives and how you're responding to that with the assurance that regardless of what you respond with, God will pursue you and is relentless in how he loves you every day all the way through to eternity. Amen.